Well, yeah. <clears throat> Hello, uh, I'm Paul Bindanagri. I'm from the UCL Institute of Archaeology, and I'm in the final year, touch wood, final year of my PhD, we'll see. Um, yes, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about some issues with the English history curriculum, so another quite depressing uh, topic. <laughs> and um, ultimately, I'm really discussing the extent to which uh, really Eurocentric narratives have essentially remained a core part of the curriculum for the better part of 100, 150 years and why this needs to change because the damaging effects it's having both on students and I've got some tentative results that suggest it may be continuing to adults and their conceptions of past narratives. So first to talk about the national curriculum, uh, we didn't have a national curriculum really officially until 1989. However, the content delivered has followed in a tradition since the first uh, compulsory schools that were introduced towards the end of the 19th century. And the content that was presented in the history syllabuses of these first compulsory schools was lifted, often adapted slightly from that which was presented in British Imperial Military Colleges and the East India Company Training Colleges. So as you can imagine, this was very, very Anglo-centric, Eurocentric, content focusing on the kings and queens of England, the great battles of North Northwestern Europe, and a bit of the classics. Oddly enough, despite the fact that this curriculum was meant to prepare young men like this for a life in service to the British Empire overseas, there was rarely any real engagement with the history of the regions in which they were going to go. That which was presented was really perjurative and imbued with tropes of primitive natives, tribalism, things like that. So yeah, not a great picture. Despite this, what came to be known as the great tradition in British history education, which is kings and queens of England, classics, and a bit of a dabbling with the global south in a very perjurative way, remains pretty much consensus to varying degrees right up until the 70s, when you had a group of young historians practicing new history come to design new school syllabuses, which were much more a focused on critical evaluation of past narratives and the skills of being a historian, and also were more representative of the schools in which they were teaching, because following the 20th century, the mid 20th century migrations, Britain had become a much more multicultural cosmopolitan place. Uh, however, this, oddly enough, was not very popular with the Thatcherite regime who were kind of in power at this time. In fact, one of them said in a uh, national publication, I can't remember if it was Thatcher or Heseltine, that uh, pupils were being corrupted with cultural relativism by these new teachers. And as such, some, a lot of educationists do kind of point to the 1989 centrally administered national curriculum as essentially being a reaction to the liberalization that happened under the new history to a certain extent. Now, this has got, kind of gone in ebbs and flows over the last 20 years or so, but for the most part, it's gone unchanged the content which was delivered on national curricula. However, in 2013, Michael Gove, who authored the uh, Notorious Gove curriculum, decided that he was going to double down on the Anglocentrism that was present in the national curriculum up, on, up until that point, with a return to the nuts and bolts of English history, or British history, whatever that means, with an emphasis on our island story and fundamental British values, whatever they mean. And yeah, educationists have said that this is essentially nationalist myth-making, with very little engagement at all with global histories outside of Europe. Uh, outside of, so the only thing on the specification that actually uh, explicitly includes non-white history is the slave trade, which is terrible because it creates this intrinsic link between blackness and servility and domination, which obviously is much more than that's the story. Um, and there is also an option for teachers, though it's a compulsory module in Key Stage 3, that teachers do deliver content on an element of non-Western history. However, they don't really specify what non-Western history is to be taught. And as such, it's really down to teachers' expertise and, crucially, the resources that are available them to, to them to deliver these lessons. And that's one thing that I want to really talk about now, is um, the resources that teachers get to use. So what I've done is I've conducted a critical review of English history textbooks for the current curriculum and looked explicitly at the ideas of Eurocentrism which often underpin these curricula. And I've also conducted some questionnaires with pupils and with adults about their understandings of historical narratives. Now, I will say the questionnaire data is quite preliminary. I haven't finished my analysis of the adults' questionnaires and I haven't got that much data from pupils, but it kind of does show a trend which I'm going to be looking much more into over the next few months. 
So the textbook research that I conducted, this is um, the sample of textbooks that I used. So nine textbooks from four of the UK's biggest educational publishers. We've got Oxford, Hodder, Collins and Pearson, all published for the current curriculum, all published since 2015. So these are very recent books and I would be prepared to wager that most state schools and schools teaching the national curriculum will use at least one of these resources. And I've looked explicitly at post at pre-colonial histories, colonial histories and post-colonial histories. And I'm just going to say it now, they're all really bad, the content that's being delivered. Um, so yeah, uh, pre-colonial histories, only one book discusses anything about pre-colonial Africa at all. That in itself is a kind of direct prelude to a discussion on the slave trade. So yeah, that's bad, but there's not much more I can say about that. Um, discussions on the Near East, pre-colonial Near East, are exclusively framed around the Crusades. So eternalizing this idea of animosity between Christendom and Islam, or between the West and the East, depending on how you look at it. And this also, this, uh, this picture on the uh, right-hand side there, that is the only book, uh, the only picture from that particular textbook which included anyone of non-white descent. As you can see, it is victorious crusaders standing over the bodies of the dead residents of Jerusalem during one of the crusades. So not good at all. Depictions of indigenous communities are arguably worse. So any discussion around indigenous communities is inherently imbued with ideas of native primitiveness and savagery. So this copper plate comes up in three or four textbooks and it shows obviously Columbus arriving on Hispaniola, greeting the naked Tainos who are either bringing gifts or running away in blind panic of the civilized Westerner who has come to occupy their land. Yeah, colonial histories, oddly enough, don't really fare much better. So for one, any discussion on violence of colonizers is minimized massively and is often framed against the violence of uh, people resisting colonization as some sort of crude justification. So uh, this image on the right hand side again, this on the top rather, this is from a, I think it's used by two or three textbooks and it shows the alleged uh, massacre at Cornpore, which may or may not have happened during the first Indian War of Independence or the Indian Mutiny, as a number of textbooks do insist on still calling it. And yeah, so this is historically contested. However, it was used to whip up a lot of anti-Indian rhetoric, both amongst soldiers of the Raj and at home, and led some really, really harsh repercussions on Indian people who were attempting to resist colonization. And in general, it's a trend that Textbooks are really far too focused, in my opinion, on presenting a very balanced impression of empire. So like whereby political instability, economic exploitation, and physical violence is somehow justified because, hey, we bought railways to India or we gave them sanitation or hospitals or a legal system, which also does imply that there was nothing even vaguely like this in colonized regions before the colonizer arrived. So we bought civilization, but yet yeah, we took some of their stuff occasionally. <laughs> and any discussion on the actual people that lived in the regions that were being colonized is essentially just underpinned with ideas of servility and submissiveness. So this image on the bottom came from a textbook and it was one of the only images of a non-white person in the textbook. And it shows a colonial officer reclining in a hammock supported by the heads of his four African servants. Now the caption to this picture reads, an amazing photograph showing a colonial officer and his African servants. No invitation for pupils to critically reflect on this, what it means about the empire, what it meant about European attitudes towards Africans is just presented as a maybe amusing historical source in this textbook. Post-colonial histories, don't get any better, oddly. So here, basically any discussion on post-colonial issues in the Global South and in Africa in particular are framed according to how bad things got since the colonists left. So this is a chart I lifted from, I think the same textbook which had that last image in. And as you can see, they've just listed a load of African countries, said who colonized them, and then said all of the, the things that went wrong after the colonizer left, generally to do with political instability, underdevelopment, famine, poverty, warfare. So the narrative that is being like played out here is that 
Because we're not teaching you any non-Western history before colonization, that didn't exist, they didn't do anything, it was basically stagnant, then colonists came, did a bit of violence, but ultimately developed these places, and the colonists left, and civilization collapsed, right? And that is the kind of underpinning story that is being weave woven through these textbooks. So yeah, I've got some questionnaire data because I wanted to see how this was actually affecting people's cognition of the past. So uh, I essentially gave a group of pupils and a group of adults some contentious statements on the past and asked them to declare their position on them. So this first one is from the school age pupils. And I said, I gave them the, the statement, historically, Europeans have always been the most developed group on earth. And just shy of 60% somewhat agree with it. I find it quite funny that absolutely none of them completely agree with it. And I kind of want to look into that further. But still, a majority do agree with this statement, which does very much echo the master narrative of the textbooks. I wanted to see again what the adults would think of this. And here we have what the adults' perspectives are in pink and the pupils remain in red. And as you can see, adults are much better when it comes to this particular statement, which does beg the question of why we need to unlearn things that we are taught in school in order to have actually reflective views. Um, but I also wanted to see if there was any kind of bridge between these groups. So I, after playing around with the data for a, a while in preparation for this discussion, in fact, I thought of why don't I filter by age and people who went to state school, so the only people in the study that would have uh, study the national curriculum since its inception. And here for that same statement, so in pink now are people who studied the new history curriculum, so that's the liberalized curricula of the 70s, and in red are the people who studied the national curriculum exclusively. And here there is quite a big discrepancy of 10% when it comes to those that agree with the idea that Europeans essentially have always been the most developed group on earth. And this is kind of reflected in another couple of questions. So the idea that European empires succeeded in spreading the idea of civilization across the globe. As you can see in both groups, this is like not disagreed with massively. It's sort of like, the, I think the mean is about 35, uh, but we've got 39% of those that studied the national curriculum plus 4% versus a much lower proportion of about 10% from those that studied the new history. And finally, the last and probably most depressing statement I gave participants was, no specific race or ethnic group is inherently more able, intelligent or industrious than any other. So essentially, do you disagree with the basis for scientific racism? And I mean, across the whole sample, only 80% completely disagree with the idea of scientific racism, which is concerning enough. But as you can see, that drops down to 70% of those that studied the national curriculum. Now, I know I haven't controlled for all of the different variables that I could do, and I will be doing that in future, so this is very much a work in progress, but I still think these results are pretty stark. So what is the role of archaeology and heritage in kind of addressing these issues? For one, how data does provide an unparalleled kind of examination of the dynamics of the pre-colonial global south, particularly in Africa. And these things are desperately needed. So in 2020, a teacher called Catherine Priggs published an article in which she had, following the Black Lives Matter movement, had made an intervention with her class to try and explore more positive African histories with them and to measure the effects of this on them. And she decided to run a module on Mansa Musa in Mali. And she said that the results were really good. However, the key issue she had was finding resources that were both comprehensible to her students and to herself so that she could effectively deliver this. So for me, I think that would be the key thing that we can get involved in. People who have an expertise of Global South archaeology, whether that's in Africa, South Asia, pre-colonial Americas, to actively get engaged with making resources that are going to be available for pupils, which will also allow pupils to critically appraise on the narratives that they are given if they are provided with the skills and counter-knowledge to actually challenge them. Thank you very much.